Hi, my name is Eric Leesberg. I'm going to be going through our WorkSoft platform, the power of process optimization, how WorkSoft allows you to have a connective automation experience, and how we use practical artificial intelligence and machine learning to help give your enterprise real superpowers. Our agenda today will cover a couple things. We're going to talk about what are these acronyms that people throw around, AI and ML specifically and give you a little bit more detail about what um, those terms mean, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and even deep learning. We'll give you an overview of the WorkSoft Connective Automation Platform, and then we'll talk about the three pillars of our Connective Automation Platform, specifically test automation, robotic process automation, and process intelligence, and our ability to give you a 360 view of your organization. And finally, we'll wrap up with a quick summary and some questions. Let's start with AIML. What are these terms that people seem to be throwing around so loosely these days? So this goes all the way back to the 50s, kind of early research. If you knew Alan Turing or ever watched the movie about his life, um, the goal was to, for him was to break uh, the Enigma uh, code that the Germans were using to communicate during World War II. And being able to have computers do some of the things that appear uh, at least to the outside, that it's uh, it's the same as what a human would do. So how can you get a human to uh, display or show artificial intelligence just the way that natural intelligence is displayed by human beings? And this research went on for decades. And then over time, that ability to sort of work with uh, more and more complex data became more and more possible as machines became more powerful, as uh, random access memory and storage became uh, bigger and more robust. And so that morphed into machine learning where artificial intelligence is still a term used, but machine learning goes a little bit deeper. And then finally, in the early, uh, early part of this uh, 21st century, deep learning has come along to be able to go even further uh, and, and further simulate some of the capabilities of the human brain. So starting with artificial intelligence in computer science, like I mentioned, it allows for anything from a computer to a robot to any kind of machine to appear human-like or have human-like intelligence. And this has become more and more common in our everyday lives. Uh, so if you've used uh, different technologies like Alexa or Google or Cortana or other uh, sort of speech-based natural language processing technologies, or maybe you've done some image searches on Google to find family members, hey, show me all the pictures on my phone uh, of my children or of my favorite pet. Uh, those are the kind of things that are using some of this artificial intelligence capability. Machine learning takes it a step further uh, and is based on simulating the neurons in the brain to create neural networks. Uh, and this is basically uh, broken into three layers, an input layer that receives the data from uh, the outside world uh, in various means, visually or through uh, textual data or other types of data. Then, of course, um, there's a hidden layer that takes that information and uses different algorithms and weightings and thresholds to be able to understand what's important to pass through to the output layer and what maybe needs to be filtered out. And then, of course, that output can be can be displayed visually or can manipulate data or aggregate data and things like that. And so that's the concept between machine learning. And you'll see a lot of different subcategories of machine learning out there from supervised to unsupervised to reinforced learning in different subcategories. And then lately, uh, deep learning has come up as kind of an extension of machine learning where you've got multiple layers uh, or hidden layers that are doing sort of that representation of those neurons in the brain, or in this case, in the computer, being able to take that complex input data that's coming in as it propagates forward through that uh, set of hidden layers in the neural network, figuring out the relationships and relative importance of things, being able to kind of adjust and refine that. Uh, and then uh, what's unique here is this ability so that as that output comes out, as, as data and information come out and that's tested in the environment, that that can then be back propagated. So kind of learnings from that. Say, for example, you uh, as a child maybe noticed that uh, the stove looked kind of interesting as it glowed hot. And then as you got near it and touched it, you realized, oh, that actually hurts. I shouldn't do that. So computers have the same way of kind of trying out their uh, approaches, seeing if that works. If it doesn't, being able to get feedback either uh, naturally uh, from the environment or from humans even. If you've used any of the recent recapture capabilities to prove you're a human while you log into your bank or things like that, you'll notice that uh, it's it's moved from 
being able to understand really crazy looking text or uh, decipher books to now being able to decipher road signs uh, and different things that you might see on the street motorcycles because it's basically humans that are helping provide that back propagation so that uh, computers can can learn from us and be able to understand what they see while they drive around to help intelligent vehicles better navigate the real world. A lot of different ways that AI are used today are in, like I mentioned, analyzing complex data like images, uh, even video, machine learning in areas like robotics or self-driving technologies or your uh, Roomba robot, things like that are all being used. Of course, chatbots and being able to understand your textual requests to be able to change HR benefits or be able to get help from a help desk are all things that we're starting to, to understand and see in our world. And so there's a lot of use cases in uh, business and in the enterprise as well as in the, in the public space from uh, fraud detection to just optimizing supply chains, understanding uh, how your customers and your partners interact with you and how your uh, employees and your organization actually does and carries out business and provide you some richer insights into that, which we'll show you uh, a little bit later with some of our capability. But these are all the areas that uh, AI tends to fall within. So let's talk a little bit about WorkSoft and our connective automation platform and how it uses some of these AI and ML techniques in a practical way. WorkSoft has been around for over 15 years. We've worked with some of the largest uh, global companies, but we also work with uh, medium to large regional uh, companies, uh, both in the public and private space. Uh, we've uh, been in, in uh, all kinds of different verticals from telecom to technology uh, to energy and healthcare. And uh, a lot of our companies uh, focus on being able to test across a, a wide variety of complex applications. Some of these are custom homegrown apps built in house. Others are packaged applications like SAP or Oracle uh, or Workday, uh, various, various stacks and technologies are all things that we work with from day to day with our customers. And so we have a lot of experience being able to understand these applications, how the business uses them, uh, be able to discover that information and quickly build documentation, test automation assets, and also robotic process automation assets uh, or basically automation in production. The three pillars of our platform start with our test automation platform. This is the platform that's been around for uh, the lifetime of our company. We've been very focused on providing rich understanding of how you carry out process in the environment and being able to turn that into rich documentation and automation. We've done this uh, in a number of ways that make it easier for uh, for the business, things like codeless automation, so the business is able to go in, capture and automate the process without having to look at lines of code. We also have robotic process automation, which takes a lot of the learnings from test automation and allows you to reuse those assets. That's what's unique about our platform, why we use, why we use the word connective in our platform is that we can connect and reuse a lot of those test automation assets, and those uh, are very relevant to production automation because Many of the same things you would use to test the system and make sure they work in all kinds of uh, edge cases and conditions and complex data sets are the same kind of things you're going to see every day in production. And so our ability to shorten that time cycle by allowing you to reuse those assets allows you to make sure that the environment is secure and stable, as well as be able to then automate that environment across uh, your different uh, landscapes. And finally, process intelligence. Uh, is something we have had for a while that we're now expanding into a lot of other areas you're going to learn today. We have the ability to capture business process uh, as a user just goes out, uh, goes about their day job. And we're able to take that information and be able to generate documentation and automation from that. But now we can also gather a lot more insight from uh, the business to be able to help us more intelligently know what to automate and where the best return on investment may occur. So with this connective automation platform, we allow you to move quickly between these different uh, pillars and be able to get uh, a broader set of value quicker uh, from the platform. And of course, it's all codeless, which allows for a larger part of the business to take part uh, in the process of improving the performance and optimizing the company. Let's start with a little brief introduction to process intelligence, and then I'll let my uh, colleague Chris here in a little bit go a little bit deeper. This allows us to gather data. We continue to add capabilities to pull data from more and more uh, areas of the business. We can mine that data uh, from different systems. We can also capture that live from individual users as they carry out process. We can then quickly turn that into documentation and automation. 
both in the form of steps uh, and details, as well as business process model notation diagrams, be able to turn that into production automation in the form of RPA, uh, and even show you best practices and where the business is, uh, is optimized and where it's uh, struggling or maybe running slower than it could be. We use AI and ML in this area. We do this in a number of ways that we'll go into in more detail. Uh, and we provide you rich visualization using a practical uh, and well-designed interface for users of all different roles to be able to take part in the process. One of the key things that gives us speed and performance in getting to automation is that we can just capture what the user does every day. And we use a couple different technologies uh, that are in sort of the AI expert systems uh, rule space. So having intelligent rules that recognize as uh, as your business users, as your subject matter experts are going through uh, and using the system, what are they doing exactly? What are they clicking on? What's the intent uh, of what they're carrying out? Being able to understand that in a rich way so that that can be used over and over again as part of our, uh, our capability. These are patented frameworks that we uh, have that our business on because they allow us to be able to work with an application, even if it changes, even if things move around on the screen or it gets versioned or upgraded. Uh, these uh, extensibility and object action frameworks allow for the business user to be able to go through and understand uh, their process simply by carrying it out like they would every day. Let's show you an example of this in action. Here I'm gonna capture a couple different things and I'm kind of giving you uh, an insight into something I'll show a little bit later. Uh, let's say that I'm a, uh, a vendor, a retail vendor that's selling customizable products. Here I'm customizing uh, maybe a piece of jewelry or it could be uh, a plant floor piece of equipment or other types of assets that my partners are placing orders for. I'm able to capture that process from a customized application uh, like the uh, Zales website I showed earlier. I'm also then able to take, uh, let's say this whole order to cash process uh, and now carry it through the various systems and able to capture that detail uh, with friendly names, screenshots, and field level shots. Here I'm in Salesforce going through and taking that uh, order and now turning it into uh, a new opportunity, a new sales opportunity in Salesforce. So no matter what the system is, from custom web to packaged Salesforce web running in the cloud uh, to on-prem systems, we're able to work with those. We'll go ahead and save this opportunity at this stage and move on to the next step in the process, which might be actually creating the physical order. We can take screenshots along the way, highlight information on the screen that's relevant, make comments, all the things we might normally uh, convey through an interview uh, or a time, uh, an interview that takes some time with, uh, with our team is something that it'll just pick up for us automatically. Here now we're over in uh, SAP and Fiori, actually capturing a process and entering some information about that same order. Here, of course, pop-ups and other screens that come up, we're able to deal with those. And in the case of a generated number, we can dynamically point out, hey, I need to note that that standard order number was created, was saved properly, and even store that order number for later. And then we can even work with rich client applications or mobile apps uh, or green screen applications, if you like. Here, we wanna pick up that same dynamic number that we had earlier from the other system and be able to enter that here. So these are all the things that we're able to simply capture so a business user, a manual tester, subject matter expert can take part in helping the team know what needs to be automated and how processes carried out in the business and all its variations across divisions. Then of course, it generates rich documentation, screenshots, as well as individual fields, text boxes, buttons, objects, uh, drop-down controls, and a rich English narrative of exactly what we're carrying out and uh, even a signature and sign-off area. This is used very commonly by our customers for training, for compliance, for requirements gathering, user story, uh, writing, test case gathering, because you've got all this rich documentation that just comes as a link in your email after you're done capturing. So this is one form of being able to speed automation using practical AI and ML. Now let's go into where we use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the test automation space. Here, we're able to take, as I showed, all of this uh, great automation that we've captured uh, and turn it into variability that runs in the test environment. This allows us to be able to carry out all kinds of different tests from unit to functional, all the way up to integration system and regression testing, uh, even things like user acceptance, positive, negative, or role-based security testing, and end-to-end -end testing are all things that we're able to do. We're even able to carry that over into the production space. 
And this is where you can start to reuse some of the same assets across the environments uh, and even across production uh, test QA and the like. This of course really increases the speed we typically find uh, that our customers are saving anywhere from three uh, X plus in time and effort to be able to create this automation and be able to capture that. And one of the ways that that happens is when we uh, capture various processes from the business, we wanna know, is this something that we've maybe already built or someone else had already captured uh, prior and we wanna just reuse what's out there. So we have this rich capability called AI search and this allows us to do a fuzzy match on anything that might already be in the system that's already being used to automate test or production. We're able to recognize anything new that the business has captured and uh, look at what we already have in our library, uh, do a quick centralized search. Since we keep everything in a uh, database that's easily searchable, we can figure out how much of a match do we have? Can we reuse what we already have? Or do we want to take this new captured process because it varies sufficiently uh, and turn that into automation quickly with a button click? What we do use is a couple different uh, capabilities. We go in and take the various information about the applications that are being captured, the windows uh, that are on the screen, the specific objects or controls or buttons that are visible uh, or even hidden. We're able to take that information, understand that, uh, look at process and sub-process details and do some rich searching. We have a uh, unique use of uh, needleman wunsch algorithm that has been used in uh, biological problem solving around protein and nucleotide sequencing, or you can think of uh, DNA sequencing, and the need to be able to use those kind of algorithms to match up uh, protein sequences are the same kind of mechanism we use to match up business processes. This allows us to be able to quickly go in and review a set of processes that we've recently captured, compare those to our uh, entire library of processes and figure out where the near matches are so that we can then review and verify, are these matches close enough to reuse or do we need to go ahead and bring in that new process uh, quickly and be able to use that. So let's show an example of this in action. Here we've got a process that we've already captured, the one from before. We can then store that, review the documentation, and now we wanna bring that into our automation environment. This quickly can be imported from our uh, stored central repository. Once we bring that information in, we, we can compare different steps. We can compare the entire process or specific sub-processes. Here we're reviewing that SAP process, uh, create an outbound delivery. So we can review, hey, how similar is that to this other process that seems to be a near match? We can actually view side-by-side uh, -side the source and the target and see exactly which steps were added or removed and see if that's similar enough to be able to be part of our reusable automation. So this again allows us to be able to quickly move uh, through the automation and be able to reuse as much as possible, saving even more time. Our next pillar is robotic process automation. Uh, and in the RPA space, there's quite a bit of focus on using AI and ML uh, with all the different uh, large data sets that exist out there and all the complexity in the production environment. It's important to be able to find uh, innovative ways to be able to handle complex scenarios. In the RPA platform, what we're doing is taking all of the learnings that we've uh, had from test automation and we're applying that to the RPA space in an intelligent way. We realize that when you move from test automation to production automation, you have a lot more uh, requirements around things like security, auditability, uh, being able to orchestrate that and, uh, and deal with compliance and other types of uh, criteria that come from the security teams or from the business audit teams. So we've provided a richer capability here with our orchestration feature that allows us to be able to create a workflow that the automation goes through. And we're able to reuse uh, a large percentage of your test automation assets to build production automation and obviously changing out the pieces to the production automation that may differ. Things like, where do I get my data? Uh, where am I gonna send results? Uh, in many cases, that might be uh, email-based versus database-based, or it might be API calls. Uh, or may just be uh, less human interaction uh, in an RPA scenario. And this of course has been able to uh, reduce a lot of time and complexity for our customers. A lot of them already have uh, RPA platforms at play, but they're also finding that the uh, WorkSoft test automation platform because of its codeless scriptless approach and the ability for the business to take part uh, allows them to work nicely side by side with their existing RPA assets to be able to create rich documentation or to be able to automate specific IT functions uh, or other parts of the business that they may need to move quicker on uh, compared to the approach that the RPA 
solutions they have in-house today. So there's often a, a, a better together kind of story there. In uh, many of these scenarios, there's a need to be able to look at complex data on the screen in the form of visual uh, visual icons or visual information and be able to uh, pull out specific data, maybe using optical character recognition uh, called OCR, or be able to just verify has something changed on the screen or not appeared on the screen the way we expected, and to be able to use the way that the human eye can look at things, but allow for the computer to take some of that uh, burden off of manual test teams and manual uh, automation teams to maybe review that through a control tower or other interface. So we've got a rich uh, capability here, both in our product around image object, as well as with our uh, partnership with Apple Tools that does visual AI. What this allows is for when computer uh, matching is done, instead of just doing simple pixel matching, uh, able to do a much richer sort of understanding of where the differences are, even if those may not uh, be due to anything more than maybe a scaling or a font uh, difference, being able to recognize small changes versus large changes uh, is something that's important and capable in the, in the platform. The visual AI solution uses a lot of the same capabilities that we've talked about earlier for the, uh, for the human eye and the brain to do what it does. It needs to use kind of this similar layer of uh, neurons, or in this case, hidden layers that allow us to be able to quickly do layout matches. Uh, and this allows for the system to be able to take large sets of data and be able to understand what's important as far as variation and what's not important. This information is centralized and then compared and continually improved. So this learning within the environment keeps uh, increasing as more and more uh, of the business and the users use the system, more that learning feeds back so that uh, as uh, a human verifies something on the screen, just like in the recaptcha scenario where we're trying to tell the computer what's a uh, motorcycle and what's a street sign, the same thing here, if I notice that the computer thinks that this difference is critical, but I don't think it's that important, I can provide that feedback information that'll back propagate to allow the improvement in the learning of the system going forward. So what that allows is for, even if there's pixel differences, for it to be able to recognize those differences in an AI method, and then be able to highlight that information. So here you can see uh, if for whatever reason the uh, system notices that the spelling uh, is off or uh, or turn in this case, the P is a Q, it'll recognize those differences and compare those side by side. Here, if the A is an O uh, or there's other minor differences that are important to point out, those can be highlighted with red circles. You can even go back and forth between the differences to see what the computer sees and say, you know, that is that is an important uh, issue that we need to resolve or, hey, it's not really that big a deal. Ignore that in the future. So it'll take that into account. And in the WorkSoft platform, we've got image object capabilities. This allows us to be able to work with uh, various kinds of image data, uh, the entire screen or subsets of the data. It allows us then to pull information off of uh, the screen itself to do optical character recognition. So if it's a maybe a, a PDF form or some kind of textual information, like in this case, um, information on the product itself that needs to be read and compared, we can do that visual verification. We use the Google Tesseract uh, OCR engine uh, as part of this capability to be able to do ad adaptive clustering, which allows us to understand what's on the screen and be able to work with that in an intelligent way. If we see issues, we can highlight those as failures so that uh, you can review and decide if that's an important thing uh, to note as a bug or to uh, consider normal and to skip in the future. So we can support those kind of scenarios. Uh, and then, of course, we integrate uh, richly to be able to carry out both kinds of automation, whether it's visual AI uh, or optical character recognition and image matching uh, to be able to carry out process on uh, visual screens. With that, I'll hand the presentation over to my colleague, Chris Bodum. Thank you, Eric. All right, All right. Uh, let's get to it. All right, um, so we've seen this earlier. <clears throat> We're gonna talk a little bit more about um, process intelligence. Process intelligence is built to provide a 360 degree view of business processes, incorporating all the process data we currently collect through capture, certify, RPA, plus BPMN, as well as best practices. Process intelligence can also ingest process mining data to create a more holistic view. I'm getting a little bit of an echo. 
Uh, Eric, can you go on mute? Awesome. Um, so we also can ingest process mining data to create a more holistic process view. All of those different types of process data are getting aligned with some clever AI and machine learning algorithms that we'll go into depth to today um, and being stored into one unified process database. This will allow the tracking of realized optimization savings. Um, what have we automated? How much is it saving us? As well as identifying and prioritizing additional test automation and RPA opportunities, uh, but more on that later. Right now, let's cover how process intelligence is using AI ML to align test automation results from certify, RPA run results from orchestrator, step-by-step -step dictated task data from capture, and process mining data. Uh, this alignment is facilitated by the use of two um, AI algorithms, the token set ratio and Levenshtein distance. So let's cover process intelligence, um, how it applies token set ratio first. When we process the four sets, the different four sets of process data, test automation, capture data, RPA data, and process mining data, each source has its own business process flow within it. Um, within, within each business process, process flow it exists at least one activity. Often there are a couple of activities. Each source has activities within the business, um, a business flow. So let's throw some more activities out there. Um, unfortunately, not all the different data sources use the same activity naming strategy. So uh, let's wipe out the names. Uh, create outbound delivery with reference to a sales order is a fantastic, clear activity label. We know what that activity is. Looking across at the other activity names in our example here, we can tell they are all the same activity. Create outbound DLV with order ref is clearly the same thing. The huge run on activity title there is also a solid match. And if we're familiar with process codes, we know that VL01N is also the same. Now, this seems like a pretty straightforward match, um, but our brain is doing a lot of the work behind the scenes to figure out that these are the same activity. If it was us, we could change them all to the same name and feel very confident that we've matched similar activities so that we can analyze them later, right? Um, but we can't sit there all day matching activities as we process them. So how do we teach a machine to do what our brains are doing? That's where the token set al algorithm rate, that's where the token set ratio algorithm comes in. First, it isolates the activity names, uh, then it aligns them and flattens them out, right? Um, the algorithm is going to work on the content of the activity title in order to calculate the similarity between these four activities. So it, it looks for similar words. It takes the similar words and weighs them heavily towards an overall similarity score. Uh, in this case, the algorithm found the words create, outbound, and order and weighed them heavily towards being similar with, the, with each other. The exception being our uh, friend down there, the VL01N. Uh, nothing to match there, so the similarity score is a big old zero. The algorithm then looks for the next set of common content across the whole set. Here we see more similar words that, while not present in every case, uh, is common between two of them with perhaps a close match to a third. Uh, the similarity score is updated. Uh, since this second pass did not have as many exact matches across as the many activities as the first, it weighs less, but it's still favorable towards a good match. Lastly, it's going to take the content that doesn't match anywhere and weigh that against the activities being the same. So now we're looking, we're looking pretty good. Um, if we set a matching threshold of 80% or above, we'd have a confident match between three of our activities, right? But we've still got to do something about that VLO1N. <clears throat> this is where we've got to help out the token set ratio out a bit, right? We need to help it with a translation table of business process codes to friendly business process names. We've built that table so that when our system processes those codes, the token set ratio sees that business process code and fills in the appropriate friendly translation and runs it similarly through the algorithm over it. Um, and we get another process score. Boom. And um, we've got a good similarity score. If our similarity threshold is 80%, then we've successfully uh, matched similar activities across our different data set. Um, with our activity names aligned across the different data sources, um, we can now move on to aligning the business processes uh, across those different sources. 
So Levenshtein distance helps us align the activities within those business processes and helps us align the business processes themselves. Here we see the same data set, data set we saw before, right? Uh, Levenstein distance is going back to look at our aligned activities and now try to determine if they belong in the same business process. Uh, to better explain this, we need to add some more activities um, and then let's make it slightly easier on ourselves to understand and uh, let's just use a certified test result and capture file. Right. While we could use the activity names we've got, uh, let's throw in some actual names to make it a little more real. All right, <clears throat> the token set ratio has aligned our activity names. So the system now sees common activity names, even though in their, still in their raw form, they still see them as the same activities. So for this example, we're gonna use common activity names just to make it easier to explain how Levenstein distance works. You can see at the top of our business process, as you can see those business process names. So even if we ran them through the token set ratio, we still wouldn't get a match that we would feel confident with. With, right, so we can't just run token set ratio over business process names, right? Um, to make things a little more real, uh, let's take away one of the activities from our test automation result. Let's say we haven't automated display sales order just yet. Now, as we look at these two business processes and our brains again, um, they know they're the same, right? They're both order to cash business processes, one from an automated test and one from a user capture, and both can confidently be matched for combined analysis. But again, how do we get a machine to do what our brains are doing? The Levenstein distance looks at the looks at these business processes and determines the distance between the two. So in other words, how many activities does it take to turn one business process into the other and vice versa? It sees common activities here, 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 and here. Um, but when it gets to this last activity, it sees our capture data has one more activity than our automated test data. Uh, the distance to turn our purple capture data into our blue automated test data is one activity. We need to subtract one activity to make the capture match the automation test data. We'd have to add one activity to our automated test data to make it the same as our capture data. Thus, the similarity between them is plus one and minus one. Right? So if we set our similarity threshold to say plus or minus two, then we're confident right now that these two processes are the same and can be analyzed as such. So let's add some more activities and let's make this a little harder. Right? We don't always get everything automated out of the gate. So let's say the human capture process in purple uh, traced a couple more activities than what we have covered yet in certified. Right? Uh, Levenstein distance would look at these two data sets find the matching activities, and then notice that there are one, two, three activities that don't exist, um, that exist in our capture data and don't exist in our blue certified test data. It would also notice that one activity would need to be added to our capture data to make it match the certified test data. The algorithm compares the certified automated test data to the capture data to find that one activity would need to be removed to match and three activities would need to be added. The sum similarity between these two activities is plus or minus two. So again, if our similarity threshold was plus or minus two, um, we meet our similarity threshold and these two business processes are now aligned for analysis, right? So we've, we've got our unified process database. Right? We've combined all the different sources of data available. All of them are, are, are not necessary, of course. We don't have to have them all. We combine two. We could combine two sources like we saw with Capture and Certify um, or combine more as it is available, um, like the process mining data or RPA data. Once we have this unified data set, um, like we see here with our unified order to cache process data, um, we can start doing things like identify which activities are automated and which ones aren't. Um, we can calculate and trend test automation coverage and track the realized ROI for test automation efforts. You know, we can also identify which activities we have already have step-by-step -step capture blueprints for. So we can expedite the building of additional automation. Um, we can identify any activities that haven't been captured yet, but are a key part of the production, pr production business process. Um, and then we can help with the prioritization of additional test automation by looking at the potential gains. This prioritization of test automation all comes from the information 
from the production process data provided by process mining and or the dictated task mining data from capture. We can track RPA activities uh, and trend RPA coverage as well as prioritize additional RPA by looking at potential RPA gains. And then we can throw parties based on the ROI from the realized RPA gains. Right? Um, we can then roll up those same metrics, those same suggested prioritizations at the business process level, determining which business processes could yield the greatest ROI. Uh, we can roll it up into departments, stack ranking department automation coverage and additional test automation RPA opportunities, and then see it all rolled up to the enterprise level, looking at overall gains and opportunities across an organization. Now, here's a quick look at how some of these metrics appear in process intelligence. Here's the overall enterprise goal of potential savings along with our realized percentage. Uh, granted, I took these screenshots from our beta data test, uh, so keep in mind that as we roll through here, we might see some, some strange numbers. Um, here's our automation potential savings along with the realized goal. Um, here we can see the breakdown by department along with the automation coverage by department. We can see, also see potential and realized ROI gains there as well. If we drill in further in process intelligence and look deeper into the processes, um, we can start to visually overlay the source of the data, looking at which activities have been automated by Certify, which are still manual, and which manual activities do we have the captured activity blueprint for at the ready for automation. From there, it's just a matter of grabbing our capture out of process intelligence and readying it for certified automation. And we've been able to surface all of this, um, all of this process intelligence value because of the work the token set ratio and Levenstein distance algorithms have done. Um, I don't usually like to reuse slides, but uh, with all that we've been through now, this should land a little bit different than it did before. Um, the unified database, bringing all that data together and then using AI and ML to align those processes. It might have seemed like a passing bullet point before, you know, a fancy filler because I needed three points to fill up my awesome purple box. Um, but now, you know, there's a lot of cool work going on behind that bullet point that helps us deliver more value, more direction, and more insight. And with everything else we've seen today, um, that's what's happening across our whole platform, right? From certified to orchestrator to process intelligence, AIML isn't just some magic word we throw around. Um, we're leveraging the power of AI and ML to drive real world value. Uh, and we'll continue to push forward with incorporating more AI ML where it makes sense, continually looking to accelerate transformation, uh, using AI ML to help find ways to deploy and apply test automation and RPA faster, uh, using AI and ML to adapt to changes faster, to self-heal, and to make smarter choices that lead to more confidence in the stability and reliability of process optimization. Thank you all for attending today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time and hope you got some valuable information from what we presented.